something like this? Uh, yeah, but you have to. This should be in front of your mouth. Uh, so it's maybe it's, uh, it's the other way around. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. <Yes>. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> this in your pocket or something. In your pocket is. Maybe it's. Just be sure that it's not uh, moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And here you have also the the pointer. Mm -hmm. The it's in the middle. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. One minute. Oh, let me just. I think we can start it. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Spectre di faccio. Spectre di faccio. I'll do this again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just start the timer. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you to, to Mario and to Aldo for, for receiving me so well here. It's a pleasure to, to be here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm João, I'm a PhD student. I'm trying to finish my PhD until uh, in the beginning of next year. Uh, I plan to talk, um, so I submitted this, this title for, for you, uh, about the low mass planets around metal poor stars. Is it, this is a program that we're conducting to search for, for these planets in a sample of metal poor stars. But I, I decided to focus a bit more on the, um, on the subject, on the actual subject that brought me here. And so I'll use this uh, metal poor program as a theme to, to set up uh, the, the methodology that I've been developing in the last few few years to to do to search for for these planets, so the actual title, more or less, that I changed a bit would be how to find uh, exoplanets and how to deal with stellar activity in in radio velocity uh, datasets. So a small outline of the talk. I'll just 
I'll start with uh, motivating why I'm doing this, this work, why I'm trying to find this planet. So there is, uh, I'll talk a bit about the connection that exists between planets and stellar metallicity. Uh, then I'll go into uh, the problem that stellar activity now poses for, for the detection of, uh, of exoplanets, of small exoplanets, and I will describe a pipeline, a new method that I've developed uh, to, to detect these, these planets in radio velocities. And then I will s uh, say a bit about the, the search for the, this program uh, with, uh, with metal poor stars. So uh, please interrupt me at, at any time or uh, ask anything if I'm not clear. So, okay, so the connection between planets and stellar metallicity. Stellar metallicity, we have to see it here as a proxy of the metallicity that was in the disk uh, when the planets formed. And so it's, it's clear that uh, the amount of uh, metals, the metal content in the disk during the planet formation will somehow affect the, this, this process of planet formation and uh, the properties of the planets might change depending on uh, on the metallicity that was in the disk, and so we can see it now as the metallicity that is in the in the star, and so there is uh, we can search for connections between properties and the uh, existence of planets and the metallicity of their host stars, and already in uh, 97 and 98, so a few years after the first uh, planet was discovered after fif uh, around 51 peg. Uh, uh, Guillermo Gonzalez found that uh, almost all stars that uh, had giant planets, orbiting giant planets, were metal rich when compared to other stars that were non, not orbited by, by some planets. And so in this case, he did some analysis. This was uh, early in the, in the exoplanet de detection, so we had about six, seven, eight uh, systems with giant planets, but they were mostly metal-rich, so there was a, a, f a big difference between the metallicity of those host stars and uh, sample uh, and uh, field stars. And this became m more clear as we had uh, more, more planets, more detections, and so by 2001 this was, there was a difference in the mean uh, metallicity of about 0 0.25 dex between hosts of giant planets and non-hosts. And so it became clear that the, um, this can be translated into uh, a, s a result that it's easier to find a giant planet orbiting a metal-rich star. So the occurrence rate, the frequency of planets, of giant planets, is a, a rising function of stellar metallicity, a, a steep <coughs> rising function. <coughs> so this became clear from radio velocity surveys. So at, uh, at the time, Coral E and, and WIC, um, and the Keck survey showed that this result, uh, the giant planets are much easier to find around metal rich stars. Uh, later, there was, so Kepler came along, it found um, a lot of small planets, not just giant planets. So, what's, what's happening? Does this uh, metallicity relation hold for small planets as well? And it seems that uh, it doesn't. So, for the case for small planets, uh, smaller than 1.7 Earth radii, uh, Bukav and Waitem found that the, there was no, practically no difference between the, the metallicities of hosts and non hosts. Thank you. <laughs> so, but, but with Kepler and with transit surveys in general, it's a bit hard to do something that it's easier in RVs, which is to be sure that a uh, star doesn't have a planet because of the way the transits work. So you are never too sure if, if it's just an orbital, uh, the, the inclination that it's not right for you to see the planet, or if the star doesn't really have a planet. Of course, we can, we can model, we can deal with that uh, effect, but it's not so easy to find, to define a control sample. So a sample that we know doesn't have planets. And so there, was, there were a few, contradictory results with Kepler, with the Kepler sample, because some authors find um, no difference in the metallicities for w uh, small planets, some authors find a few, uh, small difference, but for example, in a recent paper, the, um, the they found that the planets with at smaller orbital periods, so closer to their host stars, 
do show uh, <coughs> do show up more in meta-rich stars and less in. Uh, Is this for any mass of the planet? Or no, for for the same planet, so smaller than. Um, sorry, smaller than. Okay. Yeah, smaller than 1.7. Yeah, so we don't know their masses, but they are small planets. Um, and you see that as the as they go further away from the star, the the metallicity enhancement of the host is not is not so clear. So they they have slower metallicity, and so it became it's becoming clear also that uh, not only the occurrence of the planets changes with metallicity, but there's also an effect of the orbital period, and so there's an effect of the migration of the planets how it, how they evolve. Maybe maybe it's playing an effect. So they evolve differently in, in systems with with different metallicity. Uh, for planets, small planets that we do don't know the mass. So from radio velocity surveys, what we found back back in 2011 was that, contrary to the giant planet uh, distribution, the the one for for Neptune-like planets at that time, we only knew about 10. But this was rather a rather flat distribution, so it seemed that the occurrence of Neptune-like planets didn't depend too much on on metallicity. Sorry, this is again from radio velocities. This now this is from radio velocities, yes. So now we know their masses, okay. And this this is from the results from the survey with <coughs> with HARPS with with radio velocities. Um, of course, this changed a bit now that we know a few more. So we, we know about uh, 100, 150. Uh, planets with these masses, so Earth-like, Neptune-like uh, masses, and very recently as well, uh, Kurkoveto found that first there is there seems to be a clear uh, upper boundary for the mass of the planet that which depends <coughs> strongly on on the metallicity. Okay, so for metal-rich uh, stars, the the planets form and uh, the planets may be may form heavier planets, okay, but for metal poor stars the, there is a, an upper boundary. And this boundary also depends on the period again. So we see it, it also increases with the period. So uh, at longer periods there is less uh, low mass planets. But uh, an interesting uh, result here is that when when we start to have more planets, and so we start to be able to separate between those that are Neptune mass and those that are super Earth, so smaller than 10 Earth masses, we do start to see a difference in these two populations. So the the Neptune mass planets show some uh, metallicity enhancement relative to to non-hosts, but the um, super Earths uh, no. So maybe what it what happened here also was that we were mixing up. So here we're just dealing with low mass planets, so everything is smaller than than uh, <coughs> 0 0.1 Jupiter masses, and maybe now that we have more, we are able to distinguish these two populations of of planets. Ones that still depend on the, on the metallicity, and, and for lower mass planets it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Is this your results? Or no, 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 no. No, this is from Kurko, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a recent paper. They, so they analyzed 157 planets with masses <coughs> and with, with uh, rate of from rate of velocities. Okay, so just to briefly uh, conclude on this, or, or the the main message from from this uh, relation between planets and stellar metallicity, we know very well that the occurrence rate of giant planets depends strongly on on metallicity. It's not so clear if it, it the same happens for low mass planets, <coughs> and this is important. I, I didn't mention because the f this fact that the occurrence rate depends on metallicity allows us to put some constraints on the formation models, and so some formation some planet formation models predict this dependence, others don't, and or or it's not so easy to get this dependence. And so we can place constraints on the formation models with this uh, with these observations. <laughs> so for for smaller planets and low mass ones, it's not so clear so far if if there is uh, an effect or not, or if there are two populations of Neptune-like and Earth-like planets. And 
so migration may st uh, we, st we are starting to see that migration may, st may play a role because there is uh, a dependence on the orbital period distribution, but it's not so clear yet what what is happening. Okay, so stellar activity is um, is the the main problem nowadays when we are trying to find. We should be on the book. <laughs> okay, sorry. So. Uh, when finding these planets now in radio velocities, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk more about, about Kepler, one of the main problems that we have now is stellar activity. Mm -hmm. And why? Because uh, stars, the Sun and other stars, they're not, they're not quiet, they're not yellow circles that, that don't change, and there are magnetic features in their, um, in their surfaces that, that evolve and that uh, cause some some uh, signals, some uh, effect. So in this case we have uh, sunspots and around them usually we have plage or faculae and you also see that faculae sometimes can show up alone and that's going to be a bit uh, important. But we have this magnetic activity that changes with the activity of the star. So it changes uh, of the on the on the order of, of a few years, uh, 11 years for the Sun or 22, and for other stars we expect the same, the same changes. And also, uh, it obviously changes with, so these are magnetic features in the stellar surface, so they change with the rotation of the star. The features that we see change with as the star rotates. And it's easy to see that this, uh, the presence of any feature in the uh, stellar surface will create the radio velocity mm -hmm. signal because as the star rotates, this hemisphere is, is coming towards us, so it's blue-shifted, the other hemisphere is red-shifted, so if we, if we put a spot, or if, we, if, if this is a planet, this is the Rossiter-McLaughlin effect, if it's a spot, it's just stellar activity, so if we put a, plan a spot there, it blocks some of the, red shift, uh, the blue-shifted flux, so the star appears red-shifted. Okay. As the spot goes on the other side, the it blocks red shifted light, so the star appears blue shifted. So this the um, presence of the f these magnetic features in the stellar surface creates a radio velocity signal, which can go, uh, which was realized very early that this could happen, and it, it can be uh, important. It can be of the order of five meters per second. Important to re to remember you that um, the effect of a Earth like planet on a sun-like star is about 90 uh, centimeters per second. So it's, it's, these effects are considerable when, when we want to reach the Earth mass, <coughs> planets with the Earth mass. Um, but the sunspot is not dark like uh, the spot of a planet. No, no. It so it's simply that it's a meeting uh, with the... Uh, well, there, there, is, there is the... the it's darker than the surface, so we can consider it as just a dark spot, mm -hmm. and it will have, it will block yeah, but the but light. The sun is simply that the black body uh, emission is uh, at uh, 4,000 Kelvin instead of uh, 6,000. Yes, Kelvin, yeah, so yeah, emitting. yeah. But we it's not a spot like a planet. No, it's not. But it has some some yeah. contrast. The, so exactly the, the effect is the same. Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, we can approximate it as having a contrast of one, and just saying it's so it's a spot. Yeah, because as the star rotates, yes. Actually, that would be the rotation from the projected on the sky. Exactly. Because yeah. Yeah. So you see that this this signal, this signal will depend on the rotation of velocity of the star. It's one of the main dependence. But I didn't tell you. Obviously, this works for spots. But, <laughs> but it also. You you have a, in the audience you have a mixture of. Uh, Solar I know, yes, okay. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so this is with the questions, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. It's not, it's not. But yeah, it's darker than the surface. Yeah. Dark enough that it blocks some of the flux. Even astronomers know that. No, but I mean, is emitting this, for instance, this is, if it is a sunspot, is emitting blue shifted emission like the rest of the photosphere. But less. Yes, but less. Little less. Yes, not less. Not less like a planet. No, no, no. But you, no, you no, no, but 
the yeah. noise and noise in the, in the, in the, in the yes. shift of the spectrum. Yeah. That's, that's so there, there is a radio velocity signal that mm -hmm. appears, a contamination that appears from, from these features. And not just spots, also uh, vacui. So bright uh, points in the stellar surface also have a flux effect, which is much smaller because they are, they are not as bright as the spot is darker. But they also have another effect, which is in these regions, in these magnetic regions, they, uh, b uh, the when there is the, c the magnetic region in the spot, the convection doesn't happen as, as uh, efficiently. And, and so they have the page uh, show uh, convective blue shift, uh, block the convective blue shift that happens normally <coughs> in these in these <coughs> magnetic regions. So not just the spots have an uh, effect, but also the plage show an effect. And you can see here the effect of one spot crossing the, the equator of a star in the flux of the star, the effect of the plage, in the rate of velocities, the effect of the plage is always uh, a positive shift <coughs> in the in the rate of velocities. And uh, this is just some, some indicators, some activity indicators that, that I'll talk about later, which also show uh, a difference. So it also depend on, on the presence of these features. So it, was, it became clear that I when we are searching for planets and uh, with radio velocities, if we want to actually detect the planet and interpret radio velocity variations as due to a planet, we have to make sure that these variations don't come from the photosphere. So we have to separate the two, the two signals somehow. One of the ways that we can do this is to use uh, spectral, uh, some indicators in the spectra of the star that don't depend on the presence of the planet, but change with, with the photospheric uh, activity. And <coughs> when the spectral line profiles are constant, uh, so they don't, the profile of the spectral lines doesn't change, we, we can say that it's the signal is due to the planet. If they do, uh, <coughs> we, we say that it's instead uh, activity, stellar activity that's, that's creating the signal. And for example, one of the first indicators was, was the bisector span, so it's just a measure of the asymmetry of the spectral lines. And you see here that for, for, for the case of this star, it correlates very well with the, the change in the rate of velocity. So rate of velocity, bisector span, the asymmetry correlates well with the... It talks about yes. the star center of mass. Yeah, so uh, the star center of mass. So pure perturbation effect on the velocity, on the velocity of a star as a, as a, as a point like source. The, the one from the planet. Yes, yes. What I've seen so far also has to do with the fact that the star. No, uh, yeah, no, no. So the, uh, the radio velocity that's caused by the planet doesn't have anything to do with the rotation of the star, so it's just a shift in the center of mass. Yeah, so what, what I think is saying, so what it's saying here is that we can identify that it's due to the center of mass if the profiles don't change. Okay. And so this is the bisector span, so we can use it to, to find or to have a clue that some of the signals we see in radio velocities are not due to planets, they're due to stellar activity. Of course, the problem is, even if we uh, can, can find that, can find correlations between ra the radio velocity variations and the uh, activity indicators, it's still hard to correct for them. So it's still hard in an active star to find uh, the planets if, if, they, if, they are, if there are activity contaminations. <coughs> so I wanted to present you the, an example of Coro 7, which is <coughs> a very active star that was observed with the Coro satellite. And so you see here the, the modulation of the light curve of this, of this star, which shows uh, big dips due to the presence of spots in the, in the surface. And you can identify the rotation period of the star from, this, from these variations. So these are variations of up to 2%, uh, if I'm not mistaken, while on the Sun we see variations about 0 0.5, 0.3%. Uh, 
So this is a very active star when compared to the Sun. And so from the white curve, uh, we identified one planet uh, transiting uh, at 0 0.8 days, so about 20 hours of orbital period. And then this, um, th this was a small planet, so the, the first planet with uh, the first super Earth with the measured radius from, from the planet, from the transit. And this led to a uh, uh, very strong radio velocity follow up with HARPS, with the HARPS spectrograph. And you see here that uh, the radio velocities that were obtained and the other spectral indicators, so here is the one I showed you before, the bisector span. For uh, slowly rotating stars, it doesn't work as well. It works better for uh, fast rotators. And, but you see other indicators, so the full if of maximum of the, of the spectral lines, basically, do show a variation. And so we know that there is activity that is contaminating the radio velocities of, of this star. But now the, the point is, OK, if we still want to find the planets, uh, wh what do we do? How do we correct for this, for this stellar activity? And different ways to correct for, for the stellar activity, we can do different things. Lead to or change the, the masses, the orbital parameters. Okay, so the, the different ways in which we correct <coughs> uh, the radio velocities for this star activity effect can affect our determination of, of the masses quite a bit. Okay, <coughs> and I wanted to highlight the, the, the latest work from uh, Raphael Haywood on, on Coro 7, in which they used a new uh, follow up campaign with HARPS, which observed Coro 7 at the same time as. Coro did. Okay, so Coro came back to uh, Coro 7 and uh, made the, these observations of, of that star at the same time that the ARPS was observing. And so what they did in this paper was they modeled the activity in the photometry, so in the, fo in the flux, and they were able to, so they did that with, with the Gaussian process, which if you don't know what it is, think, think of it as just an interpolation, okay, it's just some function that will interpolate these, these points rather well. But in this case, it's, not, it's an interpolator that gives us some information about these variations, in this case, the timescales in which they change. And so from the photometry, they were able to identify the rotation period of the star, as I showed you before. So, so as you could see, is the, the period of these, of these dips, right? And also, a time scale of evolution of these active regions because in the star there's not always the same active region. They, they evolve, they, the spots appear and disappear and change and so we can identify also a time scale of evolution of these, of these regions. Now having this, so having a model for stellar activity, we have the rate of velocities, we want to, f to, to go and find the planets, so what we need to do is to go from photometry to the radio velocity. So we need to translate this signal in photometry to a signal in radio velocities. And that's not very easy to do. In this case, they used uh, what's called the FF prime method, which basically says that if you multiply the flux and its derivative, you get the basic uh, signal coming in the radio velocities. And this, is, this was developed by Suzanne Ecran. And um, so by doing that, they then they model the radio velocities with these two components. <coughs> One component that is due to planets, okay, which is a, a, a simple component in the sense that it's just uh, a sum of Keplerian functions. We know what, what this is. And another component which is due from star activity and uses the information that we learned from the, um, from the photometry. Okay, those time scales, that, that function, it uses that information to model the star activity in the radio velocities. And they were able to compare different models, so a model without planets, a model with one planet, with two, and they were able to detect that this model with the two planets was the most probable, so we had the higher probability, and also to constrain the stellar activity in, in this, or to correct for the stellar activity in this star. So I so that's basically the state of the art in this in this uh, 
way of correcting st uh, rate of velocities for, for stellar activity. I also wanted to mention very quickly one of the main reasons that brought me here, which is uh, now in, in, this, in our small community of the rate of velocities, uh, we're trying, we're involved in this challenge, <coughs> the rate of velocity fitting challenge, which it's, it's basically a hare and hounds exercise, which means that someone created uh, simulated data sets of stellar activity. We don't know what they are, and then we have to, to analyze them all together to see, to see what we find. And I, I find it funny that uh, at some point the astro seismology community did a bit of, of this with, with oscillation codes. And so we're, we're in that stage, I think, now of trying to uh, improve the way that we detect planets by using simulated data, by seeing what we're doing wrong with. Because in simulated data, we know the answer. So that's, that's easier. And, and the, an interesting result is that there seems to be a threshold in, in the amplitude of the, of, the stellar, of the planetary signals that we are not able to go uh, below that yet. <coughs> so we're doing fine for the higher mass planets, um, but it's still hard to find, even, even with uh, data sets of 500 points of rate of velocities. These are, these are the best data sets that we have. It's still hard to find small low mass planets. Okay, so basically to to summarize this, it's clear that active regions on presence on the stellar surface induce a rate of velocity contamination that that we have to deal with, and it's there plus the the signal from the planets. It's uh, we can try to use some uh, spectroscopic indicators to to decorrelate the rate of velocities to see if they are due to to atmospheric phenomena, but sometimes. Uh, it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes we see stronger correlations than, than others, it depends a lot on, on the activity of the star. And we can also try to use simultaneous photometry to, to deal with, to place constraints on the activity. Of course we don't have always simultaneous photometry, That's, it's, it's quite expensive to get uh, radio velocity and photometry at the same time. And, s and the important thing is that in the different ways we do, we correct for this, we get different results for the orbital parameters. So the, the, two, the, the way that we correct for activity necessarily needs to be uh, improved so that we get the best <coughs> orbital parameters for the planets. And so I have presented you with some sort of the problem. Now I'll present you with my solution to it, which, uh, which is this, this pipeline that, that I developed to to detect the planets. And it's based on the fact that, uh, so, simultaneous photometry is very expensive to get, uh, just radio velocities is a bit less expensive. So I went and I looked back at, at Coro 7 and I said, okay, what would we learn if we just had radio velocities and nothing else? We know nothing else about the star. <coughs> so uh, the main question is this, can we build a model for the radio velocity variations that is simpler in the sense that it only uses radio velocities and but still can manage to deal with the with stellar activity and let's let's try so basically we have a time series of radio velocities we have n times uh, n radio velocity measurements errors uh, and we need a model for these for this time series we start with the systemic velocity of the of the system, okay, basic uh, basic uh, offset, and we start with planets. <coughs> so each planet is going to have its orbital parameters, the, the period, the amplitude, eccentricity, a phase, and the uh, uh, orientation of the orbit. How many planets we have? We have NP planets, okay, this, this is our main component, and with given how many planets we have, given the times, we can calculate the Keplerian signals that we expect from these from these planets, right? So it's given their orbital parameters, we we get uh, a variation from as a function of time. Okay, another thing we can do is when we have more than one planet, when we have just one, it's fine. We can we can just put the the parameters as uh, changing in in. Uh, 
good intervals that we can choose. When we have more than one, we can use more information. So in this case, I used uh, information uh, that sets the period of the two or more planets to be close to each other, because I don't expect uh, uh, close to each other in, in a certain sense. So I don't expect planetary systems with uh, periods that are three orders of magnitude different or more. So in that sense, I just I expect them to be closer than than three orders of magnitude, and I also uh, set just a basic distribution for the for the amplitudes. Okay, but these parameters are not really necessary, so they don't add to the simplicity, but they they help us a bit. Um, so they're there, and the next so we have the planet component on one side that gives us a function, a Keplerian function, and on the other side we have again a Gaussian process, so a stellar activity component. We have something with, with a given amplitude, a given time scale of evolution, the same time scale of evolution of the active regions, the same rotation period of the star, or I should say a parameter that we can uh, uh, that we can uh, subs uh, ascribe to the rotation period. Okay, this is a parameter in my model that physically has the meaning of the rotation period. And some extra noise, we put this together into a noise model. Okay, <coughs> so we treat activity, uh, stellar activity, as correlated noise, which it, it's what basically it is. I mean, some some people call it signal, some people call it noise. I call it noise because I'm interested in the planets. So, okay, so this is a model. All of these in circles are parameters. These are observations. We're just missing one key point, which is. The only thing that we don't know here is NP, right? And the way that we used to do it is just, okay, let's try many values. Let's try with <coughs> one planet and see how this looks. Let's try with two planets and see how it looks. But we can also just do that, okay? Just create a, a model in which the number of planets itself in that I find in my data set is a free parameter, okay? And I am also fitting for that, okay? So we have uh, a number of parameters that are free. We have to set, I mean, the, the new stuff is to do this in, in the Bayesian way, so let's do that. Let's set priors for all these parameters. Let's put them in an MCMC. Okay, you, you see that it has to be some sort of special MCMC because the number of planets depends, uh, sorry, the number of parameters depends on NP. So the number of parameters changes during the MCMC. But, yes? But this NP that you introduce as an additional parameters, are you treating it as a continuous uh, parameter? No, 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 as a um, uh, discrete. Discrete, yeah, for between zero and the given maximum value that I can choose. So zero, one, two, three, but but a discrete parameter, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I know. This is yeah, 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 yeah. It's discrete. It's a, yeah. All the others are are all the others are continuous parameters. This one is a is a discrete one. And, and you see that the number of parameters in my model depends on it, right? And so it changes during the MCMC. That's that's the only difference between this sort of MCMC and the and the regular one. Otherwise, it's it's just an MCMC. So we s we have priors. We have put them in an MCMC. We have data. We get posteriors, right? And so I went and I put here the radio velocity time series of Coro Seven, and what I got was a posterior distribution for the number of planets. I mean, this is probably the most uh, important result because it's how many planets are there, right? Mm -hmm. Or or better, I shouldn't say how many planets are there, I should say how many planets do I find in this data set because that, that's not necessarily the same thing. On, yes, yes, like yes. Is this the only thing you estimate at the end of the MCMC run? Or you estimate posteriors for everything? For everything, yeah. For Every, everything in circles gets, yeah. it gets a prior and gets a posterior, okay. yeah. So yeah. And P is your most important? Yeah. It's what I wanted to know. Yes, 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 yes. Because I told you that the different ways we deal with the star activity mean different masses, but also mean different number of planets. Because sometimes we detect one or not, right? So there's also 
a question of how many pointers are actually are we actually detecting? May I ask how you set the priors? So this uh, for this case is just a uniform prior from zero to ten. No, 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 no. This is that that's that's the point. So this is one MCMC, right? That is going to get me uh, give me a posterior for NP, right? Because I start with a prior for NP, which is just uniform with a uniform distribution, yes. So I from the beginning I don't assume anything, I don't know how many pointers there are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the the other priors are, are relatively straightforward i mean there's some complication here but it's it, it's simple and so we get this posterior so remember the prior was uniform right and we get this posterior and from this posterior i concluded that we detected confidently two planets and now you tell me how can it be i mean you're crazy <laughs> what's wrong <laughs> so <laughs> so what what you need to to what we need to see here is that uh, we get the posterior, so this is a dis discrete parameter. And our question was, how many planets are we confidently detecting? So what matters is not the probability of a model with, for example, two planets. What matters is the ratio of probabilities from one to the other. So we want to be, we start with zero planets and can we, do we detect one planet? Uh, confidently, no, because the ratio uh, is not uh, big enough, or in this case it's zero because the probability of, of these two are zero. So going from one to two, do we detect uh, a second planet given that there is already one? And in this case, yes, because the ratio is bigger than some threshold. Okay? But now, going from two to three, um, that threshold that I set is, is a threshold that tells me I require very strong evidence to get a planet. So I don't like false positives. Okay, so I, I have to have uh, strong evidence to detect one planet. And the threshold was set to five. Okay, so in this case, which just means it's sort of a one sigma, two sigma kind of uh, <coughs> measure, right? And in this case, the ratio from two to three planets was smaller than five, so we don't detect three planets with confidence. Okay, even though the, this is a distribution, and I do realize that this is the highest probability uh, model. Okay, so the highest probability model is with four planets. Okay, it's just that there isn't enough evidence to tell us that there is four or that there is three. There's just enough evidence to tell us that there is two. Okay. Yes. Do you give any weight to the resonances? Uh, no, no, no. <coughs> we don't consider them. Is using, you're using Keplerian for that? Yes. So yeah, so individual Keplerians. So uh, yeah. Is yeah, yeah the, the, the it's, uh, we ignore we ignore those. We, we think we ignore any... Yes, they cannot, they cannot answer that question, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so... Why would you choose uh, five? So, so that, that yeah, uh, it, it depends if it's in the logarithm of the evidence or not. The the scale. So there is a scale that yeah. So in it, it's that it's twenty in the not logarithm. Yeah. So basically, there is a scale that uh, if it's five, it's strong evidence. If it's uh, three it's uh, moderately strong evidence so we have to set a scale we have to say how many sigmas we need basically in in this in this sense and this is is sort of an arbitrary scale as the sigma scale but it's it corresponds to the same to the same thing yes yeah it has to be a hundred thousand times more, more evidence yeah. exactly yeah yeah so, so it's a, yeah, it's a very strong uh, criteria. Th I'm saying basically, I do not want false positives, false positive detections. Okay, if I don't have enough evidence, I I just don't detect. I I prefer false negatives to false positives, which is a choice I I made. But it, it's important to realize that it's a choice you make after you get the posterior, not before. Okay, so then you have to make a decision what how you're going to get your. Uh, 
write your paper, basically, or what you're going to write in the paper, how you're going to analyze this, this posterior. Mm -hmm. So P3 over P2 is just a logarithm of that one? Uh, yes, yes, sorry. That's okay. ON, yeah. Ex ex yeah, that's why it was the infinite. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just this divided by this. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, no. Here is the probability. Yeah, yeah but it, but it's the same as the as the logarithm. But my question would be rather, what's the error on this determination? Uh, what is the error that is the error? No, I know it's I, I, as a, a, an error is the error. Yes. I understand. So, which is a probability of error. Yes. So, I will take that. Take yeah. That. But in principle, now, the, the specific question is, is this one, one big run of an MCM, uh, MCM technique? Uh, yes, so yes. In principle, you could do many runs, in theory, although the Monte Carlo... Uh, yes, you could, yeah. ...in the, in the, in the, in the, in the method. Exactly. You, you the method to actually determine to them one output of this. Yes. If you do many runs of this, it's uh, formally the same as G as continuing. The, the random generators, of course, the seeds. Yeah, yeah, but, but formally it's the same as just doing this run for a longer time. It would not be the same, exactly. It, 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 formally it is. I mean, if you do many MCMCs, I mean, in practice maybe not. Uh, to the extent I know that method, which is not that well Monte Carlo is embedded in there because it's a method of estimation to give you yes. the result. Okay? Yeah. So what I'm saying, in principle, if you do many runs, you get the histogram which is similar, mm -hmm. but not the same. Just to see how those how those relative uh, uh, the values uh, change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But but it no it does it does. But I'm saying that that uh, process of running an MCMC many times. It's equivalent to just running this MCMC for longer, right? For longer steps, for more steps. Okay. And what I did was that I ran for enough steps that this didn't change much anymore. Yeah. So it's 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 already included that Monte Carlo. So if you take the others, you would do an RMS. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I I don't know the values. Yeah. I d yeah, I don't know the values. Um. Uh, as we're doing question time, I <laughs> want to ask you how many data points were you having? Uh, for uh, so it's uh, 170. Uh, this is this is the same data that that was analyzed before. That was the number of parameters in a ten plan model. It's 59. It's 59. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah, plus the ones coming from the regression process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, have, you don't have a lot of redundancy in the, uh, the number of data points with respect to the non parameters. Yeah. So uh, maybe a word of caution there in trying to explore extremely uh, higher, uh, yes. Uh, when you don't have enough data that yeah. would give you a lot of redundancy. Yeah. In, in principle, uh, the so in, the, in any Bayesian analysis, there's a built in Occam's razor, which means that planets that are, uh, sorry, models that are too complex are penalized if the data doesn't, doesn't support them. And this is built in in the, in the analysis. So the fact that there are many parameters is not necessarily a problem in, in the sense that uh, the, if the data tells us that there is, th if there is information in the data, it will show up here. Otherwise, the, the model is just too complex and it will be penalized for for being too complex. So, it goes down. yes, yeah. Just by the fact that we uh, we prefer a simpler model uh, than than a, than a more complex. Because of the statistics, not because of the yes, yes. Yeah, that, uh, there, there is no. Yeah, yeah. So, so. so Okay, we got one posterior, right? We we can get more, and in we can also I can show you the same plot as before, and we also get a posterior distribution for the masses of the two planets that we find. So we only find two, 
and which agree with the with the previous determinations to to within one sigma we get the the best fit which includes the two planets and the stellar activity signal okay this is not just the the two planets and we get this important uh, posterior distribution which is the posterior for the eta 3 which was the rotation period uh, parameter of the star and so using only uh, 170 radio velocities nothing else no other data uh, we were able to to detect the stellar activity good enough uh, well enough that we could place a constraint on the rotation period Two, th three years, uh, three years, I think. Yeah, Th there are ma there are many rotation periods. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so we get okay. Uh, I I know about the big error bars. They're they're obviously there, uh, but we we get an estimate of the rotation period which actually agrees with the one that that uh, was obtained from the photometry. Okay. In the stellar activity signal, do you ever have uh, uh, flares? No, no, no. In this case, no. There was no. I, th I think there was no evidence for for flares in the core seven. At least in the. At least they were not seen in the radio velocities. I'm, I'm not sure if. There is no flaring stars. Yes, in this case we cannot. We don't account for that. No. It's just one star. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. It's one star for which there was no no evidence. Core seven. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I built this method, and uh, in summary, this this is an important point. We can, instead of doing individual MCMCs, we can estimate the number of planets at the same time as we do everything else. Just a bit more complicated, but not too much. And it's interesting that the radio velocities themselves contain some information about the stellar activity. We don't need extra data, at least for Coro 7, for some other stars. Maybe we, we will, will do. And we recovered the two known planets, but weaker evidence for, for a few more. And so we confident we recover only two. So just going quickly, I, mean I need to finish. So we have... Uh, a program running in in Porto with with ARPs and in which we're looking for for metal for low mass planets around metal poor stars and basically the the methods that I've shown you I've been using them in in these stars to to try to detect um, <coughs> low mass planets in in the case in which we don't see uh, activity uh, signals I just drop that part I just consider the planets but it's the same formalism and sometimes we also see activity uh, variations in these stars. So here's the, the sample that we defined. We basically, it's a moderately metal poor sample of about 100 stars. Uh, so like stars, here's, we have 10 years of radio velocity data for some of these stars. And the, um, so the, in the intrinsic errors, the, the mean error bars are around one uh, meter per second. So this is the, the, the precision that HARPS can, can give us. And some stars show uh, a variation, so a RMS that is <coughs> much bigger than the intrinsic error. So they have they have some variation that is unaccounted for with the with the errors. So this is as a function of the uh, uh, magnitude of the star. As a function of metallicity, it's also interesting to see because metal poor stars in metal poor stars it's a bit harder to d to measure the radio velocity because they have less lines or less strong lines. And for uh, lower metallicity stars, we do get an, an increase in the, in the errors that, that come out of, of, of the ARPS observations. But, but it's not a strong increase. So we have a few cases of uh, giant planets. So these are giant planets, OK, in, this, uh, in these stars, not low mass ones. And we find that uh, because we are following these uh, stars that we know have giant planets, because we want to look for uh, companions. Okay, but in the in the residuals of these fit, we don't find anything uh, conclusive yet. Uh, we have also a few just uh, long-term trends which show that there might be a companion at a very long period. Again, in when we remove these in the residuals, we don't uh, see strong. Uh, signals that we can claim detections and so so far we don't have a lot of detections um, 
I just wanted to show you this uh, graph which, uh, so this as, as the number of points, radio velocity points as we observe them, you see here the detection limits. So the mass and period of planets that, that are in the green part we could have detected with this data set, the other ones we couldn't. Okay, and what's important here, forget about the jump there, or, or ask me what it is, but forget about it. Uh, what's important here is that uh, you need a substantial number of observations in order to push these detection limits down in mass. Okay, so for, for periods longer than 10 days, 50 days, uh, even if you uh, uh, make a lot of observations, they don't go down so easily, okay? So uh, the detection of these low-mass planets requires substantial observing time because we need to get many points in on the different time scales in order to push this. On the left, the idea of the yes, yes, yes. Just as as we observe them, and and this is calculated for for a different number of of points. So right now we're pushing towards finding planets at around 50 days with uh, a mass of uh, 10, 5 Earth masses. Okay, that's where we are with most stars. And so I, I, we published the analysis of the 15 stars that have the highest number of measurements in this program. So the ones that we are more confident of that we, uh, that we can reach these detection limits. And there's only one planet detection so far. It's a Neptune-like planet. Uh, it's also a complicated system, which I didn't mention, but it's it's not an easy uh it wasn't an easy detection and so i, I calculated a, a quick uh occurrence rate and one detection in 15 stars of course this is low number of statistics but it gives me a a, a frac a frequency of planets of about six percent which is not um, which is outside of the uh, different to the one that was computed for solar metallicity stars so 12 percent occurrence rate of low mass planets around solar metallicity stars. And so this is for, for these stars, for these planets here. Um, so we, which is interesting, bec these results, because we might uh, be seeing that the, the, the fraction is smaller than what we expected, because from planet formation models, so at different metallicities, we expect many, many low mass planets, and many more with uh, lower metallicities than with higher metallicities, but we are not finding them. And so we might be seeing the evidence that indeed maybe uh, they are just too far from the star and we are not sensitive to them yet, or maybe they're not there and we need to rethink the, the, the way this is constraining the planet formation models. <coughs> okay, just take home messages. Uh, we know for giant planets what's happening, it's unclear if the occurrence rate of low mass planets depends on uh, if and how it depends on stellar metallicity. Uh, stellar activity can induce very easily radio velocity signals that make it harder to find, to detect these low mass planets. Uh, we've developed a, a new uh, algorithm, a new method to, to deal with it, just using radio velocity uh, observations. And the current results from this decade-long search for low mass planets may be hinting us that uh, th we have less detections than, than we expected, so it may be hinting us at some modifications of, of planet formation models. And I, I finish here. Sorry for taking a long time. Thank you. It, it's arbitrary, yeah. It's rather arbitrary. Yes. In, it, well, it's actually funny to see that, uh, in a sense, you could cut it yeah, at five when it starts going down. Yeah, because the the what happens in in this in the all the tests that I that I've been running is that when there are two planets, the probability of zero and one is zero, or it's not exactly zero, but in the MCMC, it, 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 there is zero samples. And then there is a jump uh, at the number of planets, and then there are smaller jumps. 
Okay, so there might be uh, evidence for a few other planets, but in principle, all of this is was unnecessary in to to run. Yes, what what I'm saying is that if I cut at five, I would get the same distribution be before. So it's important to see the ratio. Yes, yeah. The important thing is the ratio from uh, one to two to three, so going up. Uh, no, in, uh, I think I'm not completely sure, but I think it's impossible to get that because uh, because we have to say to see that if there is not enough evidence to go from one to two, then there's clearly not enough evidence for five. It, it it makes some sort of sense that it should be that way, I think. So I never got any any result like that. I think this distribution has to be just uh, picked, just one peak. Yeah. Okay, to bring the first one, just to be sure I have well understood. Yes. P3 or P2 doesn't, doesn't mean they're almost equal to 4.5. It doesn't mean that P3 is 4.5 more likely than P2, but it's e to the power of 4.5 more likely than P2. No. Yes, yeah, so this. This is the number of posterior samples. Yes. Right? How, how do you compare that in, in the likely of one model? I mean, the model with three planets. <laughs> you, and, and you, the, uh, you normalize. You normalize the distribution. Yeah. Right? So, so this is the number of posterior samples. If you normalize by the total number of... So the area under this curve, mm -hmm. you get the probability. Right? Yeah, and that's the value that uh, I also calculate, which is the uh, the, the evidence. Okay, we get to the okay. Uh, yeah. The second question is, uh, I mean, the, the case of Coro Seven is very particular because you have many observations with tight sampling. Yes. And uh, you have a lot of activity in the size active, so your Gaussian process, I mean, uh, works. Yeah. Because it finds. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you say that you apply your uh, detection pipeline to all the metal pool stars. So, what happens? No, not all, just the ones that we see uh, evidence for uh, for activity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. Th these are just the fifteen with more observations. Uh, it was it was just the ones that were observed uh, more times. Because but the question was uh, how uh, does your technique perform when you don't have a lot of observations, or you don't have a tight sampling, or you yeah. your activity indicators do not show um, any strong indication of specificity so or something yeah. like that. Uh, so in, uh, related to the activity indicators, it doesn't matter, right? Because I don't use them. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if I decide to run this, this uh, the algorithm on every star, I don't use the information from the activity indicators, so I just use the rate of velocities. Whatever is in the rate of velocities, it's what will what I will fit, right? So if there is activity in the rate of velocities, the, f the method will perform obviously better, right? The sampling matters a lot because so in the case of Core Seven, it was the ac activity signal is bigger than both of the planets, so the star is very active. For and the part you did, sorry, for the final part you did not build the sigma. Part. A sigma function. The, the, Gaussian, the Gaussian function, the Gaussian process. For Coro 7, you say that your model had the planets and the noise. Yes. Okay. Do you have the same model for the last part of the talk? Did you? Uh, no, 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 no. You just had exactly. Okay. Without activity, yeah. For those 15, yes. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W w what I'm saying is that for other stars, so th those are just the 15, right? For the others of the 100, we see some hints of stellar activity, so I can use the other component of the stellar activity. But I can also choose to use it all the time, right? And in principle, if my prior is correct, uh, the amplitude of the Gaussian process will go to zero, in principle, okay? It will, it will probably not, I mean. <laughs> I, if the prior includes zero, you're ready for <laughs> <laughs> so if if there is no evidence for correlated noise, the amplitude of the correlated noise will will go towards zero. 
Of course, in practice, this this will, you you know very well. It doesn't always work like that, but uh, the sampling affects, I think, mostly in in the case of Coro Seven, the the period, because the period is 0 0.8 days. So we needed that tight sampling to constrain that parameter, not exactly the the Gaussian process ones. So of course, we also need to constrain the rotation period well. But but in this case, the tight sampling was important for the for p uh, for the pro uh, period of the planet. I think. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what happened uh, the start of the jump? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not naive at all because it's it's really it's really uh, a crazy jump. So what happened was that after 13 years of observations. Uh, they decided to change the fibers in in harps <laughs> and the fiber the fiber yeah. <laughs> yeah. and uh, and with that there was there was an offset of about uh, 15 meters per second in um, in the rate of velocities so this is fifteen, F fifteen twenty depends on it depends on the full if off maximum. So it, it varies as a function of star. Yes, it, it varies as a function of the full if off maximum of the star, which is a problem because either now, I mean, for now for the analysis it's very hard because either we consider it, is it as a new spectrograph, a completely different spectrograph with maybe different noise uh, uh, characteristics or we just uh, push these points down by something that that depends on the star but but we're not sure yet how to deal with that uh, optimally but but it's, it's one more question i'm not sure if i understood the last part of your talk so you have run your machine your software on a number of stars mm -hmm. and you have selected the 15 more coverage right? uh, yes and uh, among these you have found one planet yes which was already known. Uh, no, so I, I mean, I found it, but it was published uh, by by our team, sort of independently. I mean, I recovered it as well, right. but so just one in this fifteen, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's thirteen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that when you say that is an integral of the masses, that planet frequency. Yes. <coughs> yeah. So yeah, the, the, the planet. Giant the low mass is, uh, you have a sensitivity up to. Up to a uh, given threshold in mass. Yeah. Yeah. I think the planet is. I think it's thirteen. I'm. I'm not. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Sinai, right? Sinai. Yes. Yes. And and the parameter that you found from your software. Agree with this uh, yes, yeah, this is a it's a complicated detection because it's uh, the period of the planet, the orbital period, is almost exactly at the rotation period, and the the, the analysis was was complicated because of that. But we couldn't find another explanation for the for the variation other than the planet, in this case. But then the the, the parameters agree uh, more or less. Yeah. Uh, twenty, f twenty-five, I think. Yeah. Yes. There was not much, uh, okay. The problem of the uh, what you call noise, the relativity, is an issue, and the problem is, has to do with the time scales. You, you said that very clearly. Now it would be nice at some point to see these time scales compared and compare these time scales to the observation period that you have, mm -hmm. because in the end. Uh, <coughs> Ideally, you can avoid to use complicated mathematics because you have to use sophisticated statistical methods because, because you know more of enough observations in the long term. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because in principle, the truth would be you can eliminate the stellar activity if you do have a lot of observations mo most of the time. Because what you can hope for is that it, it depends what kind of different from one or two or three of the planets that you're looking for, yeah. in terms of periodicity, right? So in, in, in principle, uh, 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 an infinite number of rate of velocities will give you... For Coro 7, yeah. what is the situation? I mean, how many, what is the time span of your observations 
and what is the typical time scales for certain activities? So, so the time span is about three years of the, of this for rate of for crow. Uh, I mean the photometry now because that's important in your view. No, the crow uh, is but also the photometry. But the photometry is not three years. No. Uh, f it's, I think the, the run where you have simultaneous is about one month long, so 20, 30, yeah. So it covers one rotation period, more or less, and uh, one something. And um, but th th there are previous observations when the, the planet was discovered in, in transit. Yeah, I, I, I understand, yes. Yes, 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 exactly, yeah. So I, I think we need enough observations to cover the time scales, and I think that's what you're saying. We need to sample the time scales well enough. Ideally, one would, have, would launch a mission that does spectroscopy and photography. Uh, ideally, yes. Yeah. We ideally, we would put ARPs is there in. Is there anything in the making? No, it's too tiny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a bit hard. <laughs> no, this is a very strong point. This is, this is a very strong point. Because it's not just a matter of having photometry and black It's a matter yeah. that you have to have a coverage. Which is similar because, yeah. because you see and, 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 and only photometry will not give you the problem. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Was a bit long, but okay. Fifty some. Do you see any discussion on the?